industry. The modern world would not be the same without it. The hard work of manpower is being phased out by technology. But over 150 years ago, the hard working men made the world go around. They were underpaid, lived in poor conditions where diseases were common. This was the powder keg which was ready to explode. In this documentary, I will be telling you one of Wales' first working class rebellions. This story will see corruption, violence and the birth of the Welsh martyr. Here is the story of the Merthyr Rhythm. To understand how the rebellion began in Merthyr, the main thing we need to discover is the history of Merthyr. And I'm in the area of Ponsan and Morales. And this is where Merthyr's story officially begins. Merthyr Tydfil is located in South Wales. 24 miles north of the capital city of Cardiff, it was first settled by the Romans in 47 CE, where they built a network of forts and roads. The Ro Romans withdrew from Merthyr by 380 CE. Following this, Merthyr became an agricultural area, mainly consisted of farms. It is believed that the name Tidville comes from a girl who was the daughter of a local chieftain, who was murdered by Saxon pagans. Following the Norman conquest of Wales, Mercer was handed to the Lord of Gloucester, Gilbert de Clay, where he built Morales Castle. With Mercer being a small farming village, it would explode into being an industrial hub for Wales. It was discovered that sat, it was sat on top of a deposit of coal, iron ore, limestone, timber and water. With the Industrial Revolution about to hit its peak, many ironworks and coal mines started to open across Merthyr Tydfil and the Merthyr Vale. Iron became such a prime industry for the town, many ironworks sprung up such as the Dowlas Ironworks, the Plymouth Ironworks, Penadaran Ironworks and of course, Cavartha Ironworks. Two main families created the Iron Empire in Merthyr, they were the guests and the crochets. Cavartha Ironworks became the largest ironworks in Britain and across the world, only with Blind Avon Ironworks being second to it. The Cavartha Ironworks is linked with a rail line and the Glamorganshire Canal, which led into the docks of Cardiff, which is the export of iron being brought to the South Americas and the rest of Europe. With success and growth in Mercer came tensions, and those tensions were boiling over into something else. William Crochet II was one of the leading iron masters by 1831. He owned the huge Cavartha Ironworks. Like the old lords of the past, Crochet thought he ruled Mercer due to his success and power. He was a member of the British upper class. Cr 
Crotty used his power to influence business, political bills and reform. But William Crotty did try to prevent what was coming. The problem was economical. Following the Napoleonic War, an economic crisis was ahead and it came in 1825 when the stock markets crashed. This led to overproduction of iron which led to the iron value dropping to £5 a tonne. With this big drop in value, it saw production drop with many furnaces closing across the town. Wages were cut and this was bad for the working class people of Mercer. Suddenly, most of the 30,000 people who lived in Mercer were put into extreme poverty. The court of requests came out with the bailiffs to seize anything that wasn't nailed to the floor. Westminster wanted to introduce a very unpopular truck system and the corn laws. William Crochet and Josiah John Guest of Dowless Ironworks supported the workers who were angry with these new bills and wanted to push for more reform. Crochet did try and organise a demonstration in November 1830 to try and push this reform into the House of Commons. Crochet's support was key in the, in the Mercer Radicals push for fairer working conditions and pay. Despite this, William Crochet was forced to cut the wages of his workers and redundancies were handed out to 84 puddlers. The bailiffs from the court of requests started to seize many of these workers' homes, leaving their families on the street. And by May 1831, the string was lit and it was on the brink of exploding. On 30th of May 1831, on the one common above Dowless, a mass meeting of 2,000 workers from Merthyr and Monmouthshire discussed whether to go on strike or send a petition to the King to force reform. This debate was fierce and the powder keg was about to blow up. The next morning, in the Pendering Parish in the Ronda, 38-year-old miner Lewis Lewis is waking up in the morning, ready for work. There was a knock at his door. At the door was the bailiff from the court of requests, ready to seize his trunk and return it to the shopkeeper where he bought it from. Obviously angered by this and all the injustice that happened in Merthyr, Lewis Lewis put up a fight and resistance against the bailiffs. Many of his neighbours who witnessed this were also angered by this. As Lewis Lewis was considered a pillar of the community and a hard working, honest man. Lewis Lewis then had help from his locals and they fought off the bailiffs. But they did manage to take away his trunk. As now the boiling point was done and the uprising was ready kick off. The beginning of the uprising did not start within Mercer Tidville, but it actually went on towards Aberdeer first, where one mine workers marched against his local ironmaster who cheaply employed them. In Pendarin though, Lewis's trunk was taken back from the local shopkeeper who owned it by the local people. It was placed on four men's shoulders with Lewis sitting on top of it, giving a fiery speech in Welsh. Soon after, someone threw a burning missile through the window of John Joseph Coffin, the president of the Court of Requ Requests. These small acts of defiance were the harbinger of an insurrection. The uprising finally arrived at Merthyr. It started in Kevin in Cavartha and in the castle in, in the Merthyr town centre area. Many of the rioters and protesters turned up with banners demanding for fairer wage, bread and cheese, as well as the iconic red flag of socialism was first waved in this uprising. Many of the rioters went ahead to knock on doors of the wealthiest people in Merthyr demanding for goods to be returned from the court of requests. If they didn't return it, 
severe consequences would occur for him here. As you can see behind me, I'm standing outside Cavartha Castle. This was the home of William Crawshay. And this place will become key in this uprising later on. With items now being returned to the rightful owners, the people of Merthyr and the higher up authorities had a problem. Magistrate J.D. Bruce didn't want bailiffs to go in to arrest the, the 37 individuals who reclaimed possessions for theft. Another issue is Willis Rebellion died out. But a lot of tradesmen decided to form a unit of specials that would ultimately take on the rebellion. And also, J.D. Bruce decided to call in the 93rd Foot Sutherland Regiment from Brecon as military support, as he realised this was going to get out of hand. The Castle Inn, which is in Mercer Town Centre, was surrounded by homes of bailiffs, pawnbrokers and beadles. Lewis was still sat on top of his rescue trunk but now ahead of a march of a thousand workers down Brecon Road towards the Castle Inn. The homes of these middle class people were targeted as the workers wanted to liberate the belongings which was taken from them. They decided to take furniture and issue receipts like what the bailiffs gave out. It stated the property was recovered and refusal was not an option. The angry crowd of workers was issuing payback they wanted simply because they want reform which would help their lives improve. In the middle of recovering a pair of watches from the home of the shopkeeper Thomas Lewis, the crowd was confronted by Bruce along with the magistrates John Petherick and William Lewis from the Court of Requests. Flanked by specials, the lawmen immediately saw they were hopelessly outnumbered by the crowd, which had grown to 2,000 strong. Lewis intervened to hold back the workers as Bruce flutteringly read the Riot Act, demanding people to disperse under the pain of death. This was met with at first recorded act of violence. The men were attacked by the workers where they were punched and kicked before they managed to flee back to the castle inn to hold out waiting for military support to arrive. Arrives at the home of John Coffin, the head of the Court of Requests. Anger and resentment was here at Coffin's home and they couldn't believe what was going to happen. They started to shout, give us bread or we will give you blood, calling for the records of the people who had items to take from the Court of Requests. Coffin back into the corner, tried to be tricky and tried to be smart by using obsolete records by throwing them into the crowd. The crowd led by Lewis realised that these records were obsolete they decided to break into Coffin's house, trashing it and repossessing furniture. Until he got to Coffin's office, they discovered the current records. At this time, the rioters decided to throw the records out of the window of Coffin's house and a bonfire was lit burning these records. At the time, riding in on his horse, William Crochet arrived to the commotion. Crochet was shocked and angered by this and said to himself, these are my miners. Crochet had to do something and that led him up to Brecon. The town was now at the brink of falling to the workers after leaving 
the now destroyed home of Joseph Coffin. The men headed to the ironworks to shut them down and get the rest of the workers to strike. Hundreds of men headed to Kavatha, Penadaran and Dulles. By the following morning, all the ironworks were silent. Strike action was underway. Many of the workers were still on the streets waiting for the inevitable backlash from the middle class and the court of requests. This backlash was coming headed by William Crochet. 80 men of the 93rd Foot Sutherland Highlanders were marching on towards the town with specials, bailiffs and support. Women were lying in the streets yelling at the Highlanders, go home and put some trousers on as they approached the town centre. The troops arrived at the castle inn. There were 7,000 people surrounding the castle inn and inside were many notable people such as magistrates, ironmongers and specials. The troops decided to take position in front of the castle inn and many of the rioters were there, this, this included women, children, Lewis Lewis and 23 year old Richard Lewis. The riot act was read out and it was announced that one hour countdown would be made for the rioters to disperse. The clock was ticking and the next stage of this standoff would begin. Now the troops positioned themselves in front of the castle inn. They started to fix bayonets to their guns. Many troops and William Crochet entered the inn to take up position to point guns out of the windows. A voice might have belonged to Lewis Lewis cried out in Welsh. There's no need to fear the soldiers. The game's ours. They're no more than a gooseberry in our hand. The troops knew another powder keg was about to explode. The final attempt to parley was the rioters. The workers sent 12 men, including Richard Lewis, who demanded a court of requests to be suppressed. The introduction of higher wages, the reduction of the price of basic goods and immediate reform, meaning the extension of franchise and free trade. It was refused by the middle class and the standoff continued. Rising in the middle of the chaos outside the castle pub, Josiah John Guest went back to the window and tried to plead with the rioters one more time, demanding for it to stop. But the rioters relented once again and pushed the guardsman back to the door of the pub. Again he pleaded, but the rioters started shouting in Welsh, Kausabara, which stands for cheese and bread, which is a basic demand that they are always asking for. Lewis Lewis continued by saying, stick together until we get our terms. The crowd pressed in between the soldiers and the inn, isolating and surrounding them. Guest again came to the window, saying he had done all he could. And if this went any further, you must take the consequences on yourself. The crowd was undeterred, seizing the muskets of the front of the soldiers' guns. At that moment, they surged forward, knocking down four or five troops and beginning to push their way into the inn. The troops started firing at the crowd. Many members of the crowd fell to their deaths, but they continued to try to press into the inn. With the stolen muskets, the workers decided to fight back and fire in at the troops. Hand-to-hand -hand combat quickly broke out. The workers were run out of bullets very quickly, which would lead them to fire marbles at the troops. As the battle fell out of favour of the troops, much of the mob began to retreat towards Kavartha Castle. The surviving members started to fire at Kavartha Castle in retaliation for Crochet siding with the troops. The soldiers retreated to Penadaran House to 
to gain more of an advantageous position. An arrest was made at the Castle Inn. Richard Lewis was arrested following the stabbing of Private Donald Black. This arrest would be very, very key and significant to the history of Wales. It took between 600 to 800 Yeomanry troops to pacify the uprising. As the uprising was finally over and the smouldering of the rebellion, the people of Merthyr were resentful. And now the Crown and the troops went after the leaders. With Richard Lewis now being in custody, they used him as a pawn to find the ringleader, Lewis Lewis, and other members of the uprising. And the hunt began there on. With Lewis Lewis and many other ringleaders arrested, the figures in the Mercer Rising was taken to court. This included a 62-year-old woman and Richard Lewis. The judge overseeing the case decided to take a more a lenient approach to the trial as it feared it would cause another uprising and it was decided that one of the 28 people were arrested. Many were convicted to life imprisonment or sentenced to penal transportation. Two people were made out of example though, which was Lewis Lewis and Richard Lewis who were sentenced to death by hanging. Miners across South Wales sent a petition to the judge and a series of letters from J.D. Bruce managed to get Lewis Lewis sentenced commuted to penal transportation to Australia. J.D. Bruce did not do this out of kindness of his heart for the working class people. It was out of fear of another uprising. The question is, what happened to Richard Lewis? Richard Lewis was born in 1808 in Aberavon near Port Albert in a cottage called Penderin. His father was a shoemaker where he would later become a miner in Cornerley. Lewis was literate which was rare amongst the working class where he was also educated in a chapel school. His family was devout Methodists. Richard and his family moved to Merthyr Tidville to find work in one of the collieries around 1819. While in Merthyr, Lewis worked as a coal miner and a labourer prior to the rebellion. The government led by Charles Grey wanted to make an example out of Richard Lewis and held his death sentence. Many people who met Richard Lewis believe he did not stab Private Donald Black. One of these people was an influential ironmonger from Neath, who visited him at Cardiff Gaul. The Home Secretary Lord Melbourne delayed his execution by two weeks, but still wanted to hang Lewis. On Friday the 13th of August at 8am in 1831, Richard Lewis was led out of the Cardiff Gaul. Richard Lewis would enter the gallows which is now outside the current Cardiff Market location on St Mary Street. The dra he was asked by the executioner if he had any last words. Lewis spoke about inequality and he said it in Welsh. The trapdoor did eventually drop on Richard Lewis's life and that was the end of him and he would instantly become martyred by the people of Merthyr and the people of Aberavon. He would also go by a new nickname of Dick Penderin, obviously Dick for the shortened term of the name Richard and Penderin to the village he lived near Merthyr. It is believed also that following his execution, moments after, his wife, who was heavily pregnant, miscarried due to the stress of his demise. Richard Lewis was instantly martyred by the Welsh working class. He gained a very notable nickname, Dick Penderin, which would become an iconic hero in Welsh culture. 
His body was taken back to Aberavon and a funeral was held at St Mary's Church. It was attended by thousands of people. It was believed that the blood soaked red flags were waving at his funeral. Following the rebellion, Mercer's iron industry did recover and had another peak in production. The population peaked to nearly 52,000, but in 1861, the iron industry in Wales was declining. Penadaron closed in 1859 and Plymouth in 1880. Thereafter, some iron workers migrated to the United States or even the Ukraine when Merthyr engineer John Hughes established an iron works in 1869 creating the new city of Donetsk in the process. With coal mining becoming very popular in Wales, I'm here at Blind Avon Iron Works, one of the well preserved and standing iron works in Wales. Towns like Blind Avon adapted to the change in industry from the ironmongering into steelworks and into eventually coal mining as the big pit colliery is only about a mile down the road to my right by here. Unlike Blind Avon, Merthyr struggled to adapt to the change and the inevitable collapse of the iron industry and the steel industry ensued. Merthyr did have a coal mine within its vale, within its valley, at the Merthyr Vale in Aberfan, but that would see tragedy itself in the future. This is what the people of Merthyr was getting angry with. Places like this. I am standing in the Blaine Avon company shop for the ironworks. So as I explained at the start of the documentary that things were paid via the truck system so you had these little tokens by your employer and basically these tokens can only be spent in places like here so you can't take them to regular shops outside the company's sphere so shops like this paid for everything via the truck system they tend to have a photo of the Iron Master on the wall in the cases of means that it would be Josiah John Guest or William Crochet but you could get everything for possibly an inflated value here and that angered people because that was a way of excuses to save money remember after the Napoleonic Wars money was scarce in Britain and an economic crisis ensued so the anger was boiling over at that point and that's what caused this uprising this institutions like this. Also here in Blaine Avenue Iron Works they have these cottages which go to the eras. I'm in the 1840 cottage. I know this is nine years after the Mercer Uprising but this will give you a little indication of what the conditions people were living in another factor that would have caused the uprising. This is the master bed by you, and you will see in a second the cot which the child has slept. And if you're wondering what's all this lying in the wall, this is wallpaper, but made up of newspapers. So these people would get the local newspaper, in the case of here, the Birmingham Post, and all these were made. This is what the conditions is, and I can tell you for a fact, this house isn't very warm as it is now. So considering the living conditions, I'm going to show you what the next room shows me. Right, by here now is four beds, where in fact it's just like a really thin mattress with pillows and a thin sheet covering it. These are probably the children's beds. This shows the poverty that these people were protesting against. And there's a very, very small room with a little window, so that's where the light in is very poor. Just imagine in the winter, food is scarce as it is, with this new truck system. And then you have thin blanketed beds on the floor with a small window, a 
menolak untuk tidak. In 1919, Mercer's largest ironworks, Kavartha, ceased production for the final time. All that remains behind me are these giant blast furnaces, which a new retail park has been built on top of as well. And now overgrown and forgotten, this is the end of the industry side of Merthyr. Coal production will continue in the Vale, down Merthyr Vale in Aberfan, but the history of Merthyr died in 1919 with the cease of production here. Only eight years following the uprising in Merthyr, Newport had one of his own. The Chartist uprising was led by John Frost and Zephaniah Williams. They took a cohesion of men from the valleys down towards the centre of Newport. The Chartists pushed for reform and doing so, the only way they could find it was cause a riot. The Chartists converged from the valleys and such towns as Blackwood, Monmouth and Blaine Avon. The Chartists would ultimately fail, but many of these people, such as John Frost, would become key in the history of Newport. And the legacy of the Merth Uprising even lived on to 1901, where the Todapandi riots broke out in the South Wales Valleys. What happened to the key people involved in the Mercer Rising? Lewis Lewis, the ringleader of the rebellion, was transported to Australia via the vessel John in 1832. He would go on to pass away on the 6th of September 1847 in Port Macquarie in New South Wales. William Crawshay. He remained the owner of Kavartha Ironworks until his death in 1867. He remained living at Kavartha Castle and oversaw a mini peak in production in the early 1850s. Crochet rebuilt his reputation following the rebellion. He raised the wages of his workers a few years later. Josiah John Guest. A year following the rebellion, Guest became the MP for Mercer Tidville and he held a seat in the House of Commons for 20 years. In 1833, he would marry Lady Charlotte Guest, would go on to later discover the ruins of Morales Castle. The Mercer Rising became a symbol of Welsh defiance against the oppressors. It may not have been successful, but it changed how the working class is viewed by the middle class. Lessons wasn't learnt when you look at the Chartist Uprising of Newport. Mercer's Uprising left a legacy on political ideals of socialism and communism. You see the red flags of the workers was used by the Soviet Union and is the current national flag of China. This would go on to inspire Karl Marx as well and his writings standing up to the bourgeoisie in the Communist Manifesto. The British political party Labour colours are red and they wave the red flags as a symbol of the politics. They may not be as extreme as the communists but the legacy of the Mercer uprising is still felt in the United Kingdom to this day. I am high up in the Waterman Tower of the Blaine Avon Ironworks which was a feature that none of the Ironworks in Mercer actually had. Before I end off this documentary, 
I just want to say you don't see industrial towns like this anymore in Wales, especially ones which is so steep in history. Blyne Avenue here is a World Heritage Site. The entire town, Mercer, is considered a heritage, heritage town, an industrial town, and was the biggest in Britain, as you found out earlier on. But this documentary is to reflect on how workers' rights have changed as well, thanks to these uprisings of the Mercer Uprising, which led nine years later into the Chartist Uprising of Newport. And then you had the Tonopandi riots in the early 19th, the 20th century, sorry. And it is sad what happened in Mercy, especially to Dick Pendera and Richard Lewis, who life has snatched up off him from an early age, in his 20s. Wrongfully so. There is a petition that was sent to the Senate to get him officially pardoned, which I think the aim was 1,000 signatures and only hit 600. And I do believe Richard Lewis should be pardoned for his actions, whether he stabbed Donald Black or not. The only negative thing I will say about the Mercer Uprising is that socialism was kind of born from it. It was born from it. The red flags you see of certain socialist movements, the communist movement, which communism destroyed many people's lives in mainland Europe, in China, in Cuba, in Thailand, not Thailand, Vietnam, sorry, and that red flag came from Bertha, dipped into pig's blood. But, do get more moderate movements from it was the red flag, like the Labour movement in Britain, which waved the red flag. But the true legacy of Merthyr is <coughs> unbelievable. Whether you go from the early years of Morales Castle to the Industrial Age to even now looking what Merthyr's future is, whereas Merthyr Town Football Club has been a big pillar of the community. It's incredible what comes from an uprising and how the world have changed. Thank you for watching today's documentary guys. If you do want to see more content from me and more documentaries please hit subscribe. And if you did like the video give it a thumbs up and turn on the notification bell for more. So we'll have more documentaries coming up in the next year. Dick Pender in 18 Y, Levi Estrin in Iverwai.